A study that came out recently massively caught my eye. It claims to have found the first ever evidence that a black hole has grown by consuming dark matter. And the black hole in question? Well, it's the supermassive one at the center of the galaxy Messier 87. The image of which was released back in 2019 was the first ever image taken of a black hole. Now, the image has given us a really accurate measurement of this black hole's mass at a whopping 6.5 billion times heavier than the sun. And it's that accurate measurement that's allowed the authors of this study to make this claim that this black hole contains dark matter. Now, this is not a new idea. People have considered for a long time whether black holes could grow to these supermassive proportions, millions to billions of times heavier than the sun, by accreting or slowly bringing in under gravity dark matter. There's always been a number of complications that come with that. Not least the fact that we don't know what dark matter is made of yet. However, this study claims that this idea of the supermassive black hole growing by taking in dark matter would actually help solve another problem in astrophysics that's to do with the distribution of dark matter in galaxies. Hence why it's so compelling. So let's dive into this. First of all, let's start with a, a bit of a recap on dark matter. Now, I've made a video before on this channel that recaps all the evidence that we've collected over the past century that's led astrophysicists to conclude there must be this dark matter in the universe. Essentially, we know it exists because of its strong gravitational effects. We notice the effect of gravity that has on other things around it. The problem is we just can't see any matter that's giving out any light to go with it. Think of it this way. Of the four fundamental forces of physics, it seems to only care for one of them, although perhaps the strong force also somehow holds together whatever particles dark matter might be made of if it does turn out to be a particle. If you think about dark matter in this way, it might not seem like as strange of the concept to you anymore. In the same way that normal oxygen and nitrogen that we encounter every day in the air aren't radioactive and therefore don't interact with the weak force. Another of the four fundamental forces of physics. One thing we do know about dark matter though and its properties is that it is collisionless. Now, those of you who've seen the video I made on this idea of whether it was even possible for black holes to grow by accreting dark matter that I made a few years ago might remember this. If we think about normal matter, say the molecules of gas in the air around us, the warmer the air, the more energy each of the individual molecules will have and the more they'll be moving around and the more they'll be bouncing off each other and transferring energy through collisions. Just like balls on a pool table or a snooker table hit one into the other, one might even stop and the other one might carry on. The two balls have transferred energy through collisions. All gases do this, including the very, very sparse hydrogen gas that fills the space between galaxies of stars when they're clustered together. When two galaxy clusters collide, all the gas that fills the space between the galaxies in the cluster also collides as well, transferring energy. It heats up and it even starts to glow and give off X-ray light that we can detect with X-ray telescopes. Now, this is a really famous image of the bullet cluster, which is two galaxy clusters that have collided. And colored pink there in the middle is the hot X-ray emission from the gas that's collided right where the two galaxy clusters impacted each other. What you'll notice though, is that the galaxies of stars, however, are on either side of that, essentially having flown right through each other with no two stars colliding. If we then look at the gravitational effects that this cluster has, say for example, on light coming from galaxies behind it, Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that massive objects curve space-time, so light traveling across that curved space-time will have its path bent. And you see distant galaxies looking like arcs in a process known as gravitational lensing. So if we do that with the bullet cluster and look where the majority of the mass is concentrated, first of all, we find that it's about 10 times more mass than we can account for in stuff that we can see with gas and stars, and B, that if we map it out, we get this blue colored 
region. That's where all the dark matter is. And in the collision, it followed the galaxies of stars. It too sailed on through and didn't get stuck in the middle like the gas did. It is collisionless. So why is this such a big deal for the growth of black holes? Well, collisions is the only process that we know of to stop stuff just orbiting a black hole and actually fall in and contribute to the growth and add to a black hole's mass. Gas that gets too close to a black hole will be pulled into orbit, into what's known as an accretion disk. The black hole is spinning, so it's like taking a bowl of pizza dough and, you know, setting it spinning above your head. It, it flattens out into a disk. Problem is, the gas in that disk is just on a happy orbit around that black hole and will continue on that orbit forevermore unless you have collisions of two particles that can exchange energy. Again, just like back to our balls on a pool table. Sometimes you can play a shot where the cue ball completely stops and transfers all its energy to the other ball. The same thing can happen in the accretion disk around a black hole with particles. You can have two particles that collide, one of which gains all the energy and probably can escape from the accretion disk because you know we're near the actual event horizon of the black hole at that point of no return. But the other one, loses all its energy and all of a sudden it can't maintain that orbit around the black hole and so it does fall in beyond the event horizon and contribute to the mass of the black hole. That is how this process of accretion works and it's how black holes grow. But dark matter is collision-less. So if some dark matter gets pulled into that accretion disk as well, then it's just going to get stuck there because it can't collide with anything else to exchange energy so it actually falls in and instead will just remain on an orbit. The only way you could maybe get dark matter into a black hole is if it happened to fall in on exactly the right trajectory and hit the bullseye, essentially. So groups that have attempted to simulate this process happening suggest that it could account for a maximum of about 10% of supermassive black hole's mass if conditions were just right, but it's much likely that it's less than that. Combine that with the fact that black holes are bald and we could never test whether black holes actually do contain dark matter. By bald, I'm referring to what's known as the no hair theorem that states that essentially the only three parameters that you can measure about a black hole is its mass, its charge, and its spin. Essentially all other information is erased. Like for example, what element the matter that's fallen into that black hole actually was. So you could never say whether a black hole is made of 80% hydrogen and 10% helium or 10% dark matter. All of that information is erased beyond the event horizon. So we can't test any of these simulations. And yet this new study, which came out earlier this year, thinks they found a way to know that the supermassive black hole at the center of Messier 87 has grown by accreting dark matter. And they pull together two known problems as evidence. The first one is that the supermassive black hole at the center of M87 is overmassive. It's more massive than you would predict it would be. So there's a well-known correlation between the mass of the supermassive black hole and the movement of stars in a galaxy that puts the Event Horizon Telescope's estimate of its mass at 2 billion times the mass of the sun heavier than expected from this correlation. And number two, if you model the gravitational effects of Messier 87, the galaxy, then you can work out how the dark matter is distributed through that galaxy. And you find that there's this unexpected dearth of dark matter in the very center compared to what you would expect from our best model of cosmology and how galaxies evolve. The amount of mass that's missing is 2 billion times heavier than the sun. The same as what you find for how overmassive the supermassive black hole is in the center. So because those numbers are very similar when you estimate them, the authors of this study, De Laurenti and Salucci, have suggested the black hole has grown by somehow accreting that dark matter. Now, there are a huge number of caveats around this argument, not least the fact that it could just be a coincidence. 
First of all, though, that correlation between the black hole mass and the movement of the stars, what's known as the velocity dispersion, essentially the spread in the velocities. So when there's really nice ordered rotation, say, for example, in a spiral galaxy, most of the stars have very similar velocities. So there's not much of a spread in the distribution that you get. Whereas if you have something that's much more like Messier 87, which is just essentially this giant blob of a galaxy, you've got stars moving on all sorts of different planes of orbits or all different velocities. So when you make the distribution of all those velocities, it's much broader. There is more dispersion in the velocity distribution. And this comes about because of galaxy mergers. The more mergers a galaxy goes through, the more the orbits of the stars get scrambled into something essentially resembling a beehive with no order of rotation and a much bigger spread in the velocities of stars. But this correlation is known to have a lot of scatter around it. Galaxies don't lie directly on it all the time, which could just be due to measurement error, you know, our uncertainty on how well we've actually measured the mass of the supermassive black hole or the spread in the velocity distribution. But also it could just be to natural randomness as well. Whatever situation an individual galaxy finds itself in that might mean, oh, this specific thing happened, so it wasn't able to grow its supermassive black hole as big necessarily for whatever reason. Now, the difference in the predicted mass and the actual measured mass of the supermassive black hole in the center of M87 is larger than the estimated uncertainty or measurement error. But this difference still could just be because of variation, natural randomness, rather than any extra growth through dark matter. Second of all, there's this argument for the distribution of dark matter in the galaxy. Now, the expected distribution of dark matter, given everything we know about cosmology and the universe and how galaxies form, that expected distribution is known as the navarro frank white profile. It's the distribution that makes the most mathematical sense and gives us the best match in a simulated universe to the observed universe. But of course, when we then go and try to actually measure this in real galaxies is when things start to get a little bit messy, especially in things like dwarf galaxies and also much smaller spiral or disk galaxies as well. We find that there's not a cusp of dark matter in the middle, like a little bump in the middle like we'd expect from a Navarro Frank White profile. But instead, they seem to have a dearth of dark matter in the middle, like it's been cored out like an apple. This is known as the core cusp problem, and it's still currently unsolved. So clearly, our understanding of how dark matter should be distributed in galaxies still has some holes in it. So even though those numbers are so close to each other, the excess in the mass of the supermassive black hole and the dearth in the dark matter compared to what's expected, and as tempting as it is to link the two, we can't get too excited just yet because of all of these caveats. But if it was the case that supermassive black holes could grow by accreting the dark matter from around them, that could change everything. Claims that this would help solve another problem in astrophysics that astrophysics, you'd think I would say that word enough that I wouldn't stumble over it. But groups that have tried to simulate this have suggested that it, at its maximum is probably around about 10% of a supermassive, supermassive, <gasps> supermassive black hole. Give me love then. Give me some passion, self-gravity and some dark matter, I'll treat you, even though your collision lurks. So you can get a model for the dark matter distribution and you find that there's a dearth in the, oh, dearth, oh, it sounds so like, sad, doesn't it? Can we say dearth cheerily? Dearth! <laughs> I don't want to hear that defeatist attitude. We're screwed. 